Um, okay. Okay, so for this module, our learning objectives are to understand that microbi microbiome data is usually relative abundance. So I'm gonna start with that. It's an important concept. What rarefaction is and sort of how it's used. Uh, we'll go over the basic microbial ecology terms, alpha and beta diversity, what that actually means and how to calculate them, why we would need a phylogenetic tree in those metrics, uh, what a peak away is, and um, how to do statistical testing sort of on a peak away. Uh, we'll cover Permanova in this session. So this was a concept I decided to add in a little bit because sometimes we added in the previous module, but just to make it really clear to people, I think it's important when you're writing up results and interpretation of the data is obviously that we're doing sequencing and the amounts that we get back are all relative abundance. We're not actually quantifying the original amount of total bacteria, say, in the sample. So what does that mean? It means that if we have this part, just the top, say we have two taxa, A and B, and this is what we would get back. We would get back relative abundance, or we would at least convert it to relative abundance um, of these two taxa. But if we went back to the original sample, the reality is it depends on how many cells were in that original sample. So for sure, if the uh, absolute number of cells is roughly equal, then our relative abundance, you know, greatly reflects essentially the absolute abundance. But it might be that sample B just has a lot less microbial load, right? There's just less cells overall. So if you compare someone's, you know, stool sample versus like taking a swab off this desk, assuming it's fairly clean, you know, the microbial load is going to be a lot less on here. And the take home message is that we wouldn't want to say that in sample B, in this case, that there's more of this microbe. There's, there's more relative abundance of this microbe, but there's not, there's not more. The importance is there is that sometimes people get into talking about, say, like pathogens or something, right? And you think about, oh, there's a great, you know, increase in pathogens on my table compared to our stool sample. But it's not, right? It's just that, okay, there's an increase in the relative abundance. It's important when you're talking about it in the paper and just thinking about, you know, I'm not measuring absolute abundances. And then the last example is, of course, you know, you could get to the point where I guess the biomass is low and then they're actually equal in absolute terms. So in almost all cases, it is relative abundance that we're talking about. Uh, although at the very last slide of today's lecture, we'll talk about full circle, how we can maybe think about transforming data into absolute abundances using other techniques. So along with this idea is that our sequencing from sample sample doesn't reflect, again, the absolute abundance of a particular sample, right? You think, uh, so what I mean there is, so sample A has a lot of, uh, a higher read depth than sample B. We would expect that, you know, you might think, oh, well, sample A is more bacteria. The reality is not. The sequencing depth is not tied to biological amounts of cells or something, right? And that just happens be because during you know, our preparation, we do DNA extraction. Those efficiencies are different. They sort of saturate. We actually take similar amounts of sample and add them together when we multiplex. And so that creates just variability in how much DNA we add together, right? So sometimes people get confused and they say, oh, well, I have a lot more reads in these samples and these samples, so that must biologically mean something. And it usually, usually doesn't. That being said, sometimes obviously sequencing fails or you get very few reads per sample because obviously there wasn't a lot of PCR amplification. And so, yeah, low, low yields can be like, well, you know, at some threshold, you don't have a lot of cells. And so you just do have poor sequencing. But once you're getting to sort of normal amounts, more DNA, more sequencing doesn't relate to more biological material. So the problem then with that is when we interpret the data, we have this uneven sequencing depth, right? It's just a natural product of, of, of it. It'd be perfect if you got exactly, say 50,000 reads per sample, but the reality is you're gonna get variation especially with 16S data where there's a lot of multiplexing. 
And you can imagine then that if you have a sample where you have higher sequencing depth than another sample and you're counting, say, the number of species in your sample, greater sequencing is going to result in greater sequencing depth, right? You can think about this from, you know, I think an example that you can use is if from ecology terms, if you went out and spent, you know, an hour looking for grasshoppers and then you try to count up the number of you know, grasshoppers in the tree types of butterflies, you know, for an hour, and then you spent, you know, five hours, you would, you would find more butter, more types of butterflies probably, right? But you wouldn't want to say that those two things are equal. You'd have to normalize by the amount of time spent looking for butterflies. And so it's the same with microbiome data. We have to account for that, and we have to try to normalize for that sequencing depth, because to compare it apples to apples is it's not, right? You're just more sequencing depth will lead to usually more counts. So one way you can sort of get a handle on this is through uh, generating rarefaction curves. And rarefaction essentially is uh, a micro is an ecology term that refers to the ability to subsample your each sample to different depths and to visualize that subsampling. True rarefaction does that multiple times per sample so that you're not just doing a subsampling once and sort of visualizing that. You actually subsample each sample multiple times and then sort of take the mean or calculate the standard deviation. And then a rarefaction curve like this is just visualizing that subsampling and then looking at something on the y-axis, usually species richness. And what do we mean by species richness? Literally just the number of taxa that we're looking at. So if it was ASVs, usually we would report the number of ASVs as richness. And so that's on the y-axis here. And then we have our sequencing depth on the x-axis, right? And typically what we would see is that some samples, we had more sequencing depth, right? Showing where they sequenced. So this sample, we only got say, just over 2,600 different sequences for it. Whereas these ones over here, we got over 10,000. And what you can see here is then with, by subsampling, subsampling it, you sort of see, you know, is there a difference between them? Uh, and this gives you information about your sample. So it sort of provides two different types of things. One, it gives you an idea too, if you've actually done enough sequencing where you're sort of saturating your diversity. Right, so in this one, you see that by around the mark of 2,500 sequences, or these ones, or at least 5,000, they're really leveling off, right? We have obtained pretty good idea of the total richness in those samples because it's plateauing. Sort of, yeah, yeah. Um, Exactly, yeah. I'll get to there, almost. Um, so in this one, great. Maybe the diversity isn't as high and, and we see sequencing depths essentially saturating very well. Whereas with these sets of samples, you know, they're still sort of curving upwards, right? With some of those. And maybe the plateau is actually occurring, you know, way over here at 20,000. So this comes back to your question a little bit about, you know, how much sequencing depth do you need? As long as these both look pretty reasonable, <laughs> Right. But if you sequence something and they're like really at the start of the curve, you're like, oh, like I, I kind of don't have enough data here to to you do have enough data to do lots, but obviously your estimates of the total richness is is gonna vary a lot. The other thing obviously it shows you is the amount of variation in sort of across your samples, like whether all your samples are pretty similar already uh, in total richness, which is actually a measure of alpha diversity, we'll talk about in a second. Uh, so with this one, we see, you know, quite a bit of variation. This one as well. I mean, these are different scales, obviously, of richness. But essentially, yes, this lets you uh, visualize that component. The other thing rarefaction is used for is actually controlling and normalizing for your data before you proceed to other steps. So you visualized it here. That's great. Then people will use it to say, I'm going to pick a cutoff like you did in the lab yesterday, where this is the sequencing depth that I will subsample all the other samples down to so that they're equal. 
right? So we're spending the same amount of time looking for butterflies. And so, great. You look at these and you say, okay, my cutoff is going to be maybe for this one in panel B, it's 2,500 sequences. Because if we chose 5,000, well, these ones actually, we didn't have that much sequencing depth, right? So that's problematic. So we usually choose essentially the value at which all the samples have obtained that sequencing depth um, and we can move on. Now, sometimes some of them aren't gonna get to what we would have ideally enough sequences. And what we end up doing is choosing a higher threshold and then just losing those samples, right? We just say, well, I don't want a subsample all the way down to 2000 in this case. I want to subsample to 5,000 and I'm willing to lose all the samples below this. So that's sort of what we did yesterday in choosing a sequencing depth. These curves help sort of visualize that and make a decision about it. And there's other, other ways as well. But essentially rarefaction is a way to overcome this normalization approach, right? Normalize the data, move on. And now you feel that the sequencing depth is not going to cause a problem with me measuring other things about the samples. Does that make sense, that approach? The obvious thing about that is that you lose a lot of data, right? So if I choose 2,500, that means I'm throwing away all this information over here, which is kind of not satisfying, <laughs> right? Um, and essentially, you know, this was brought to light by a famous paper in 2014, over 10 years ago or just 10 years ago, I guess now, uh, by Susan Holmes, who's primarily a statistician. And she had this uh, pun like pointed uh, title about waste not, want not, why rarefying microbiome data is inadmissible. And the argument is, is, is basically that. It's just that throwing away a lot of data is not a good thing statistically. And they have this, you know, this simple, simple example in their paper and it's just showing a simple thing where if this was our original abundance between two samples, A and B, for two OTUs, because OTUs are still used back then, not ASPs, right? And we have 100 and 1,000, you know, the suggestion would be that we, oh, sorry, is that we subsample sample B to 100. This is a pretty extreme example of it, but not unreasonable. So that now we can compare A and B equally. And their point is, is that, that reduces our statistical power. That's the main argument, right? So if we test for differences in OTUs across our samples, in the original format, we get statistical significance with different statistical measures. But with the rarefied data, we lose statistical power and now it's not significant. That's the simple argument. There is no like, it's wrong. It's not that it's necessarily like corrupting your data or like your interpretation is incorrect. The main argument is that you lose statistical power. Yeah, did you have a question? Uh, but I mean, if isn't it better to lose the statistical power if it was, wasn't really meaningful data because it's a artifact of sequencing? Yes. Like, I mean, yeah, why would you be more interested in keeping statistical power if it means that your data doesn't make sense? Right. So then they go on to basically say, well, there's better ways to do this. Yeah. So then their argument essentially is instead of just, you know, throwing away the data, really we should transform the data in different ways to account for that while keeping the statistical power. The catch is, is that for many years during this and after, there wasn't really like, oh, this is the approach you should do. That's obviously better. It still corrects for that you know, sequencing depth error perfectly um, and everyone agreed upon it. So what happened, there was a bit of divide essentially where people were like, I'm still gonna do rarefaction and I'm okay with it. Taking heat over it because the rearers would point at this paper and say, you shouldn't do that. This statistical person said you shouldn't. But yeah, the only downside is that, hey, maybe I won't find as many things as I should. And I think it's an important context for it. So statistically not, the best, but not wrong per se. Yeah. Along with that came another pointed paper a few years later uh, by Greg Lohr that also brought up this issue that's related to this, that essentially microbiome data is compositional. 
and that the way we analyze data should take that into account. It's not optional. Very pointed statisticians. I love them. <laughs> um, and so what does that mean that the data is compositional? It just means that the way that sequencing data is, we have a sort of a ceiling essentially on, on our effort level. So unlike the, um, the butterfly example, where we go out and we spend time and we, and we pick butterflies, sequencing depth is, 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 is capped out because we have a maximum out of, amount of sequences we're gonna get back from the sequencer. There is a ceiling on that. And that ceiling then applies to each sample in your sample. And what that means is essentially, you know, you're gonna, you can convert this to relative abundance at some point. It looks like, it looks like counts, but really you're gonna refer to it as relative abundance as we looked at before. But it means that if we compare, you know, a change in a taxa across samples, an increase in one taxa in one sample could mean that it's just a decrease in another taxa in that sample. And it's hard to distinguish those things separate from each other because it has to sum up to one, right? So an increase in one results in the others looking like less. And that's essentially compositionality. It gets way more technical than that if you want to look at the Wikipedia about the statistical terms around compositionality. But it means that essentially for something to look like it increases, the others have to decrease. And essentially what that means is that statistically, the tax are not independent from each other, right? We, we sort of treat them like that. We look at a spreadsheet and we say, oh, this count has gone up or down with relative abundance. But the reality is an increase in one tax that means the others had to decrease. Or maybe it's the decrease in some tax that resulted in the increase of the others. And it's this lack of independence that then creates a bit of havoc on classical statistical measures because they require that independence. So the argument at that point was like, oh, you know, there's these standard approaches for a lot of different things here. People should be using compositional approaches. And compositionality goes across not just microbiome data, it's like a whole field on its own because other types of data have this. And there is ways to try to normalize for that without doing essentially rarefaction. So just ignore most of the bottom parts. I'm going to talk about this, but the biggest thing is up here at the top. Again, the standard approach is maybe rarefaction. Now it's getting hammered by the statisticians for you know throwing away data. And it's also now getting hammered because it's compositionality and maybe it doesn't still account for ways to, to, to approach that. And the way to do that is other types of data transformations. And I'm gonna just talk about the CLR eventually uh, as the main component of how to transform the data instead of verifying. And we'll talk about that towards the end. So, uh, just this past January, after about a decade of this is going on and creating a bit of havoc while statisticians said, no, you shouldn't do this. And then microbiome researchers, the biologists that we sort of are just like, I don't care. I'm going to still do it. And then every time it would like a review, it would sometimes flag it a non. It was just really annoying. So patch loss got sort of annoyed, I think with this. <laughs> well, I know he did because I talked to him about it. And so he published this very pointed uh, rebuttal, essentially, to the original paper, Waste Not, Want Not, Revisiting the Analysis, and actually went through every single part of the original paper, very scientifically, very debative, and showed, you know, that some of the assumptions were incorrect or the interpretations of how the original paper went about it was, was maybe not super accurate. I am not going to get into the piece by piece, you know, comparison. But essentially, this did provide a bit of published data to say, hey, people that do rarefaction aren't completed to lunch. It's not a big deal. It's probably OK, and we should move on with our lives. So the take home message for you is what should you do? Well, it depends, of course. But now you have you know, papers, depending on what camp you want to be in, in the, hey, should I do rarefaction or should I do CLR? And we'll, we're going to talk about it a little bit more. But we're going to back up just a second, because I promise we'd talk more about alpha and beta diversity. So we're going to go there next. Uh, is that good for that little section? Compositional data, rarefaction. Basically, big debate in the field, not settled, 
Um, but at least there's some decent papers on both sides. Okay, so you've done some sort of normalization to your data. Say you've done rarefaction, you're not worried about sequencing depth anymore. How do we then start to characterize the sample, right? What do we start to get out of it? And so we're going to talk about alpha diversity and beta diversity. And the really simple things are alpha diversity is basically looking at diversity within a single sample. And then you look at the diversity over here, but you don't, you don't like look at their overlap, right? You're just counting things in this sample, and then you're counting things over in this sample, and then you're doing measurements. And beta diversity is comparing samples, looking at their overlap to each other. That's the biggest take home message. Before we get any further with the types of those measurements, uh, we're gonna talk about phylogenetic tree because you need a phylogenetic tree to conduct the metrics of some alpha and beta diversities. Some alpha beta diversities include using a phylogeny. Some don't, but because some do, and some very popular ones like Unifrac use a tree, then we need to construct a phylogenetic tree. Phylogy, any uh, phylogenetics people in the in the audience here? They're very opinionated because <laughs> it has to do with evolution. Uh, and so the take home message here is that we need a tree, right? We need a tree. We're not going to debate about it. It's going to like differ possibly across projects, but practical reasons, we need a tree. It doesn't have to be the be all end all tree. It just has to be a tree that we can use in a metric. Yeah. Yes. The metrics generating the tree. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yep. Add in one other way of bias. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, if you're doing a metadata analysis, that's why you might not want to compare, you know, someone's alpha diversity just point blanche over here to over here. You'd have to go back to the raw data, obviously, and and process it, and then assume all the other biases were in a factor as well. So there's sort of three major approaches here. This one's really nice because I think we've settled this now, even though we've gone through a historical um, smorgasbord of this. But essentially what we have is that if we're looking at 16S as our, as our marker here, we've only sequenced a single portion of that, uh, of that gene. Could be V4, it could be a bit longer if you did V4, V5. And then we have to essentially get to the point where, okay, we have just this fraction of them, and then we have some reference 16S sequences from databases. How do we make a phylogeny out of, out of this data, right? We have a chunk, and then we also have sometimes full length sequences. If you have ever done any basic phylogenetics, you know, you make a multiple sequence alignment and you sort of have to have, you know, the ends all agree so that that, that turns into a phylogenetic tree. The take home message here is that there's sort of three major ways. The first was read recruitment. So this black, um, phylogenetic tree just represents a known reference tree. It could have been made like in Silva or green genes. And then all you do is essentially take your reads, which are represented in red here, and you map them to the tree, the closest tip in the tree. And you just say, this is the tree I'm going to use. And you prune it essentially to just these tips. And you say, that's my tree. That was used for a while, but what happens if your reference tree you know, doesn't capture all the diversity in your samples. This could be problematic because you're just saying, well, it's it's close enough, but well, maybe the closest tip isn't isn't that close. The other approach is you just build a new tree altogether. You just take your short reads. You don't worry about the reference sequences at all. You build a de novo tree from scratch and you use this. Um, okay, you could do that as well. You can imagine though that de novo tree could fluctuate a lot, especially if it's only based on very small fragments compared to a known reference tree. So this tree could fluctuate a lot more across projects. And then the last one is I think where we've all settled, which makes a lot more sense is you use the best of both worlds where you use your reference tree in black here, and you essentially insert the fragments into that tree, allowing those inserts to be wherever they need to be. They could be close to the tip, they could be far on the branch, 
And basically this became available because um, essentially placement methods got faster and better over time. Uh, and so I would say the vast majority of people are, are doing this approach. It's this insertion tree approach. Should have mentioned this at the first, what the hell's SOTUs? This is just historical. For a period, there was a argument about what to call ASVs and some people wanted to call them sub OTUs. That's gone. We all agree it's ASVs now. <laughs> So for, I think the vast majority people use this insertion tree approach. There are different file genetic methods to do that insertion. Uh, the one that people typically use, I guess, in our pipeline is called SEP. Uh, and it's built right into Chime in their plugin called Chime to Fragment Insertion. But there are different options for that. Not a big debate. Bam, you make a tree, it's done. That makes sense? Great. OK. Going back to alpha diversity. Okay, so say we have two samples. Uh, how are we gonna compare these two things? Uh, so on here, we basically say, well, let's look at, uh, let's look at these two samples. In this, both cases, we have five species uh, and they're colored and they look differently. Thank you, Robin, it's very beautiful, beautiful, beautiful uh, things. I used to have stars, they were very gross and just boring. So she made nicer figures. Uh, and then we, over here, we have a different sample we also have five species. They happen to be the same five species or colors uh, with obviously different amounts, different relative abundances in those two things. And alpha diversity is saying, okay, let's, let's count the difference between those two things. And the two major components of this is richness, which I already alluded to, is literally just the number of different species. So literally the richness for this one is five. The richness for this one is five, but that, doesn't capture the difference between those two, right? One, the other component of this is evenness. How equally sort of distributed are those species within the sample? And so with this one, this one is much more, has higher evenness, whereas this one's much more dominated by this one species, number four, right? You can visually see that as well as the counts. And so this sample wouldn't have as high evenness. And when we talk about alpha diversity, you can measure those two things separately, or we can combine them together to calculate diversity. So if someone says this has higher alpha diversity than this sample, well, what do you mean? Do you mean richness? Do you mean evenness? Or do you mean some combination of those two things? And the evenness thing is just because people think this looks you know, more diverse, right? This one's dominated by one with a few scragglers along the way. All oh, right, there's more examples. So here's sample three and four. Sample three, right? What would we say here for their richness? We would count one, two, three. This one is four, this one's five, this one's five. And if we calculate evenness, then you see that this varies quite a bit. So now this one has less richness um, than this one, but the evenness is much higher. And that's literally what alpha diversity is. Pretty, pretty straightforward stuff. Of course, you know, people get a hold of it and mathematicians and e microbial ecologists or ecologists like to calculate different ways to measure those things and maybe combine them. But essentially people report on those two things, richness and evenness directly. And there's other terms out there. So there's Shannon index, Simpson's diversity, uh, lots of different measures out there. But essentially, at some point, they use that information to calculate an alpha diversity. Another well-known one is uh, Chow one. And now people I know are going to say, oh, that's how you pronounce that. I don't know for sure. <laughs> We've had the debate in my lab. I think it's Chow one. I think people sort of agree on that. Could be Cow one. I'm going to say Chow one. Uh, and essentially, this is similar to richness, except that if you remember back to our, um, our rare faction curves, I'll go back there really quick. Oh. You can imagine that based on these curves, you could probably make a prediction of what the total richness is in that sample, right? You haven't saturated. These ones sort of have. So richness in Cal 1 would probably be very close. Cal 1 tries to predict what the total richness would be, essentially based on this curve. Yeah? That's the, that's the only thing that's about it, which is nice. So if in, in samples where you've had really good saturation in your sequencing, 
child one and uh, richness should be really close. And then the other big one is uh, face PD. PD standing for phylogenetic distance. So that's why we need a tree for this particular measure. The other ones didn't require phylogenetic tree. Face PD does. Sometimes it's just referred to as PD without the face. The person that developed it, their last name was Faith. And face PD is also pretty straightforward. This would use our reference tree coming from our samples. And essentially what happens is you label the tips in the tree that have that organism in it. So this is comparing two different samples. So imagine we have these four different uh, taxa present in this sample. These four taxa present in this sample. The richness would be the same. But if you look at this, this represents less phylogenetic diversity, right? They're closer together in the tree, whereas these are a bit more spread out on the tree. And so PD is literally just the total sum of branch lengths in a sample. So you would literally sum up these branch lengths. That would be your phylogenetic distance for sample A. You would sum up the phylogenetic distance uh, the branch lengths here for sample B, and you would compare those. And then you would say sample B and A have, oh, right, have the same richness. Sample B has a higher phylogenetic diversity than sample A. So it takes into account, you know, the idea with phylogenetic is that it doesn't treat every organism as independent, right? These two things are quite similar to each other phylogenetically. Maybe they're functionally similar. So we'll talk about later this afternoon. And so the idea is being we should sort of not treat them the same as, hey, this one versus this one. So we treat that diversity different. Good. Wonderful. OK, great. Uh, so then moving on to beta diversity. So beta diversity essentially is now looking at those samples, doing those types of counts. But what we're looking for is comparing, essentially, our samples together, right? We're looking for overlap in the types of species they have, and also often how close in counts are these two samples, right? So you could say that the distance between these two or their beta diversity is probably closer just by looking at it between these two as opposed to these two over here, right? Sample one, sample three, there's no green guys. It's dominated by red. Their distance from each other would be further, right? So it's a distance or similarity essentially between samples to say how close they are. And of course, we can calculate that lots of different ways as well. So uh, I would say still the most popular is Unifrac. Uh, it is a phylogenetic method. And it comes down into two flavors. I'll show in the next one. It comes down to a weighted Unifrac, right? So this sounds like a really fancy term. All it means is that it takes into account those relative abundances, the actual counts. Unweighted literally just says, we're going to say everything that is a zero is a zero. Anything with a non-zero is one. And so it just converts everything to presence absence. When you see unweighted, even if it's not a unifrac measurement, that means it's just doing presence absence analysis. So you're losing information, right? You're throwing away all that information about, you know, the counts. Um, but the idea being that maybe it helps compare when you're really interested in rare things. It treats rare things the same as dominant things. And so the rationale is you would usually start with weighted, but sometimes people are like, well, I don't see much of a difference. Let's try unweighted. And oh, there's some grouping going on. That means maybe that difference is, is contributed by the more rare taxa in the sample. There is non uh, phylogenetic methods as well. The most famous would be Bray Curtis. Uh, it's a disseminary measure. Uh, usually that's done at the ASV level. Jacquard is also a unweighted approach. It's not called unweighted, unfortunately, but essentially it's a presence absent based. And there's a lot of other measures. And most of these metrics all come from ecology, the people that went for butterflies. And then we've adapted them into microbial ecology and they've stuck around for a long time. All right. 
Uh, yep, question. Uh, that's a good point. I've heard the term a bunch of So Bray Curtis is is not um, it's not defined by what how you do the comparison. So typically, yes, you would say essentially what you come down to is a, two samples, and you need a way to say I want to compare this taxa to this taxa, right? It's just like a correlation essentially. You know, like a Pearson correlation is literally a type of beta diversity measurement. And then there's just lots of different types. And so um, you could do a Bray Curtis at the ASV level. That's typically what's done. You could do things where you collapse to the genus level and then do Bray Curtis across the genus level. There's nothing about Bray Curtis that cares about what the underlying data is. But I would say 95% of the time when someone reports Bray Curtis, they are doing it at the ASV level. And the rationale around that is otherwise you're collapsing taxonomy and you're possibly losing information. But there's nothing, there's nothing to say you couldn't do it. Yeah. So just to explain Unifrac a little bit more, again, it uses a phylogeny, which we provide to it. Uh, and what it does is it just looks for the unique fraction, that's where Unifrac comes from, unique fraction of branch lengths that uh, are shared between the two samples. So this is just two different communities here represented by uh, organisms in a, the red box community versus the green circle communities. And if the communities were quite similar to each other, we would imagine having you know, these being at the exact same tip or very short branch lengths to each other. Whereas if the communities were quite different, it would have taxa in one part of the tree versus taxa in another part of the tree. And the unifrax distance measure is essentially comparing the fraction of, um, of unique branch lengths over the total branch length in the, in the total tree. And again, we can use unweighted, which ignores those relative abundances, or weighted, which essentially scales those branch lengths by that relative abundance. All right, all good there. Wonderful. Okay, so you calculate a beta diversity measure, whatever it is, it's Bray Curtis, it's, it's Unifrac. What do you do with those? Well, you could basically make a distance matrix, which looks like this, where you calculate all those distances between all your samples, right? Going to take a little bit longer if you have thousands of thousands of samples because this matrix gets really big. But now you have this information. You have information about how similar uh, your samples are. You could put this into a heat map kind of like this, and you could actually look at it and it gives you some idea. You could even do clustering on this. Like if you have quite a few samples and, and, and build like a heat map with clustering based on beta diversity measurements, you can do that. Um, but often it's still maybe not super satisfying. So then we kind of try to want to visualize that in maybe a better way. And that's where it feeds into principal coordinate analysis or PCOAs or PCOAs. I said PCOAs, didn't I today? Yes, PCOAs. Um, and so PCOA stands for principal coordinate analysis. It's a type of multi-dimensional scaling. And essentially what it does is tries to distill this distance matrix into a 2D or 3D image. And this image basically represents how similar these two samples are based on that beta diversity measurement you used in, in this space. The reason it has to get complicated, right? It's just because this gets very large. So you have a distance between two things. That's easy. You represent it here. Now you have a distance between all three things. That would make a third dimension. You could do that, but now you have you know, another sample, that's a fourth dimension, which is we, we, we can't visualize very well. And then we have all these dimensions, right? Every time you add a, a different distance. And techniques like peak away, and there's other types as well, and MDS, distill all those distances as much as possible to conserve or to maximize the variation in your sample and visualize it either in 2Ds 
or if you've seen the rotating, you know, third dimensional peak OA in three dimensions. It does that by essentially distilling that information into principal components, okay? The first PC, PC1, has tries to maximize the most variation. PC2 maximizes the next amount of variation. PC3, often the third dimension, would maximize that information. Typically, people don't go beyond that. There's nothing to say you can't. You can actually go and compare, maybe PC4 is where I see the variation, PC5 variation. But each one of those uh, accounts for less of the variation in your data. So this is a very extreme example. You see this percentage. These are sometimes good to look at. That means on PC1, it's accounted for 99% of their variation just by this single line by plotting them along this line. Because in this case, it's only four samples. PC2 then accounts for another perfect 0.95%. So now all variation is literally captured in these two dimensions because this is just a toy example. When you have thousands of samples, these values get quite low. And so people get really excited about saying, oh, there's some separation. Then you're like, well, okay, but that accounts for, you know, 5% of the variation in the total of the sample. So there's a lot of other stuff going on, but it is maximizing those differences. It also means that you should treat this PC1 as you should almost weight it more in your head. So let's look at example, sample one to sample four. They're actually pretty close, 0.123. But you look at this graph and you go, oh, but why is sample one up here and sample four is here? Like why that they look really far apart. But remember, PC one is the majority of the popul uh, the variation. So if you collapse PC two, sample one and sample four are right next to each other. Yeah. So the PC one is more important. You see the separation. You're like, oh, you see two groups on this group here, group here, big difference. With this, this is only 1% versus 99%. Great, there's some separation, but it's it's not nearly as important as this. At one point, there was a, you could actually scale your piece away by this percent variation to kind of help with that visualization, but people don't do that much anymore. Uh, what else do I want to say? Okay, one more step back. Principal corn analysis, peak OAs require beta diversity to go into it. You change your beta diversity, it changes the peak away. You change the samples, right? That go into the peak away, your whole peak away changes. It's an important concept because sometimes people will wanna say, oh, what if I just remove this group? I'll just delete these samples from the graph. Chime lets you do that, lets you turn them off. But it's a bit misleading because that's, the peak away is generated on the total amount. And so if you decide to leave some samples out or you want to test only two groups instead of three, you should really redo your peak away. Lastly, there is what's called a P yeah, I asked you a question. There is a PCA, which essentially is a really simple version that doesn't require you to calculate a beta diversity first. So sometimes you'll see the term PCA is principal component analysis. It's like, the beginner step of this principal core analysis is thought to be better because you're defining the, the distance measure that goes into this. And I just found out yesterday that the only difference is that a PCA just actually uses what's called a Euclidean distance in the, in the background. You always learn something when you actually dive in and read about it. So anyway, I learned that yesterday. Okay, yes, uh, was there a question in the back, I think? Yep. Okay. Yeah. You want me to explain that again? Yeah, yeah sure. So really simply, because Pico A1 has such a high fraction of variability, what you could do is imagine you just collapse this axis and now you just drop all those points to this line on the bottom, right? So you literally just have PC1 here. Sample four is literally right next to it with sample one would be right here if they're on the same line. 
should make an animation. Yeah, I'll do an animation in the future. That'd be nice. Yeah. So it's nice. So when you interpret data, you'll see clustering. You say, oh, well, this is a nice grouping, maybe along PC1. That's the majority of the variation. Yeah. Sometimes that's driven by those confounding variables. Yeah. You get <laughs> institution here, institution samples here, and then you see this major separation. But sometimes PC2 comes in, and then you get like institution. And if you're really lucky, you'll have like healthy controls and disease. And so now PC2 explains the thing you're interested in, in an ideal world. So even though you have that big bias going on, you can sometimes pick up other signal in the other pieces. Yeah. Could you, could you increase your bias as you increase your PC OA? So if you went up to like PC OA uh, like five or six, would that mean that anything that you're showing in your graph could actually be less like a real thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, typically people don't do it. I think I did it in a paper a long time ago, and I think I got hammered on a little bit. Um, it increases your bias. Well, right. your bias in that maybe you're you're hunting for things that yeah. don't exist. <laughs> sure, sure. I I think it comes back to probably like whether you can make up. <laughs> No, I shouldn't say you make up. You think that there's a good reason why it's not popping out, right? That there's some other major signal that's influencing the other PCs. And it's not until I get to a further PC that I see some sort of separation. But at that point, then, is it that what you thought originally was wrong or that? Uh, this is science now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is science. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, honestly, in the previous example, the dots weren't colored, right? But the, the idea here is now is that we, we generate the beta diversity measurement, we create the peak OA, and then we can overlay with that colors from our metadata file of different things that we think of our interest from your samples, right? We color them by usually the biological thing that we're grouping by. That could be two colors, it could be three colors, it could be multiple colors. But the nice thing about this is once you have your peak OA, you can test different groupings, right? Like you'll go into Chime Viewer and you can change now the grouping color to say, oh, so I see a cluster here and I see sort of a cluster here. Uh, what's driving those clusters? Well, you start to include different types of metadata to see what's driving that signal, right? And maybe this is a technical artifact, the separation along PC1. Maybe it's uh, some other confounding variable. Maybe it's like, if it's humans, it's like a sex difference. Um, but you're basically looking for clustering because the, the overall interpretation, remember, is that closer samples are more similar to each other. Great. Okay. Uh, so that's good. Hand wavy. I see things in a peak away. <laughs> Statisticians don't like that because, uh, especially if you're in my lab where we look at oral microbiome and that we don't see clusters like this much anymore. It's just like a bit of a glom. And then so you, you know, you start to say, is that is that some separation I see? So then obviously enters uh, statistics, right? How do we test whether this clustering is significant? And to do that, we would usually apply what would be called a PermaNova test. Uh, so PermaNova stands for Permutational Multivariate Analysis of Variance. I'm sure most people have heard of ANOVA, right? Uh, essentially, this is kind of like an ANOVA and that you can apply it to two groups or three groups or four groups and ask, is there a difference, which I'll define in a second, between those groups? And the important thing here is that it's ANOVAs are typically uh, require, God. <laughs> what's that called? <laughs> Normalize it. What's it called? Oh my goodness. Normal distribution. Thank you. That thing. That group. Yes. Wow. Um, whereas Perminovas basically do a non-parametric approach. They do not require uh, the data to be normalized. Um, okay. So then what is it actually looking for? Essentially, it's looking for the groups, how different they are by looking at their centroids and the dispersion from those centroids. So I don't have an example here, but I'm sure you might've seen a figure where you have a figure like this and then you see those ellipses, right? Sometimes they have like stars 
from the cool angles coming from them. But essentially, the, that visualization is added on after to sort of characterize that dispersion of the data. And the centroid of those circle is being sort of tested to say, this group is significantly different from this group. And the way to do that is because it's non-parametric and it's not assuming any sort of distribution in the background is it's uh, essentially randomly assigning samples to those groups, shuffling it, and then testing for significance over time, right? And if you do essentially that random shuffling in the background, you look for signal over top of that. This is a very classic non-parametric approach to do. Instead of assuming a, a, a some sort of distribution, you just basically randomize the data, hope that now there's no signal, and that the previous signal in your groups is, is significantly above that. People say permanova. It's as as far as I think I can agree. I think everyone agrees. It's essentially a synonym for also the term called adonis. So uh, adonis is a is a type of permanova test. Those two things are basically interchangeable, right? But if you ran a permanova test, people would assume you're doing an adonis test, and adonis test is like specifically what it's called usually in like an R package or in Chime. There are other, other types of permanova-like tests that do slightly different things. The other big one would be called AnoSim. It's a slightly different approach. It's thought to be maybe a bit more sensitive to variation in the groups. I would say those are the two major ones that I've seen. I think typically they also sometimes allow for inclusion of other factors better than each other, depending on really how it's implemented. Other factors being confounding variables. But usually you would apply that and the take-home message is you're going to have a peak away. You're going to report some sort of permanova test with it. And often if you see a p-value in the upper little corner, that's the p-value associated with a permanova test. And also you can get a r or r squared value that indicates the, um, the amount of separation, essentially how significant that is. Okay, so where am I at? It is 10 o'clock. Good. Really? Is it 10? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so that's basically gets you through most. Oh, yeah, sorry, question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's, it's going to be one value, right? Is it, was it only just saying like you have multiple samples? Exactly. There's a, there's a difference somewhere, but not necessarily multiple. Samples. Yeah, yeah, thanks, actually. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. Actually, I didn't mean to bring that up. So it is kind of like an ANOVA, you know, if you had ever done an ANOVA, it basically says these groups aren't all the same. It doesn't say, you know, which of the groups are different. So if it's two groups, it doesn't matter. If you have five groups, it doesn't say which one is different. But usually, uh, often when it's implemented, you can basically do the permanovas on all combinations, and you'll often see that reported out. So you can get a permanova for the entire thing, and then you can get permanovas essentially for pairs of groups that you care about. Yeah, and you can either, either do that yourself manually, or depending on the implementation, it'll sometimes just spit it out by default. But yeah, the interpretation is, so if you have one group out to lunch, and then all the other ones are the same, you're like, oh yeah, look at that significance. It doesn't it just says that something doesn't agree, doesn't get into you know all the different um, sort of post ad hoc tests we would call them. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So then, essentially, the post hoc test is literally just another permanova. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like a. It's not a different test like we would think of in. Other statistical approaches. Yeah. So you would just do one compared to two steps each other. So you would say which ones are different from each other? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay, great. Okay, so then uh, that's the basis of it. I just want to come back a little bit to compositionality data uh, and what to do about it if you're concerned about it. Because, like I said, you're sort of depending on your camp, some people are like, no, I am a compositional person. <laughs> I, I am that person. I don't want to rarefy my data. I want to do this thing. I, I'm a believer. Uh, that's great. Those people are good too. And the measure, and I would say the methods have gotten better too, where we've started to shift some of our approaches to more compositionality. 
I think before I, you know, in our lab, we just did rarefaction because I didn't have a solution for it to how to handle all things. And we still don't for all measures, but it is getting better. Uh, but the big take home message is that just coming back, remember, so this is the normalization for sequencing depth, right? If you want to apply a compositional approach, you're not going to rarefy your data first, right? That's like, that's the whole reason why you're applying a compositional approach mostly is to get away from having to rarefy your data. So you would not rarefy your data. You would apply basically in the most easiest and straight form approach is some other transformation. There are a few different transformations out there, but the most sort of agreed upon approach right now would be the center log ratio transformation. I'm not gonna get into it, uh, but essentially it changes your counts into essentially a ratio uh, into small numbers. Some of those numbers can actually be negative, which is problematic a little bit. Uh, and then the major sort of hurdle for CLR for a long time was that it can't handle zero values in your starting data. And microbiome data is very zero heavy. We have a lot of taxa that are present. And so the way to get around that with CLR transformation is to add this thing called pseudo counts. So you literally just change it from zero because essentially it requires the it requires you taking the log of zero, which you can't do, right? So it just breaks the system. Mathematically not possible. And so you just add a very small fake number to all your zeros. So you don't have zeros anymore. That would be a pseudo count. And that's okay. Yeah. Uh, it then creates a little bit of other headaches. And then you sort of just go, okay, well, that's what we'll do. Um, and that's what people did for a while. But we'll start to see there's maybe some other approaches to it. Some people would do the CLR approach and then just hammer that data into like Bray Curtis or weighted Unifrac. Don't do that. Don't do that. Like, that's not a good idea. Some of those values are negatives. Uh, Unifrac will be like, you have negative values. Here's your results anyway. And then you're like, cool. Um, it, it may be, it may give you some results that look meaningful. It's just probably not a great idea. So it means that instead of using like Ray Curtis or Unifrac with CLR data, you have to apply, you know, some other distance measure. So I call these cutting edge biodiversity metrics. <laughs> and so the first approach was, uh, so the biggest one that people would say instead of using break curse away Unifrac would be uh, Atchison distance. So you use Atchison distance, it's a compositionally aware approach. And essentially all it does is within it, depending on how it's implemented, a CLR transformation on your data, followed by a really simple Euclidean distance measure. Uh, and then you would feed that into essentially your PicoA, and now it's great. You've used your data uh, and wonderful. We found that when you tested actual samples, that uh, it wasn't very sensitive enough. So often we would, when I think we've tested it multiple times in the past, you look across different projects, you see pretty good separation with, say, weighted Unifrac, Bray Curtis with a rare faction approach ahead of time but you apply an action distance and you don't see a great separation. And all biologists go, well, that's not really good. <laughs> I don't want to use something that where I don't see signal where I think there really should be signal. Also, this whole pseudo count thing was just probably leading to pushing some of that lack of signal, right? Cause you're sort of getting rid of all your zeros and that wasn't really satisfying either. Uh, so there's been this thing called robust Atchison, which is nice. Uh, it avoids pseudo counts. It literally performs CLR on all the values that aren't zero and then just adds the zeros back in. Uh, robust Atchison is, you'll see it often called RPCA. So that's really nice. And then you get the people say, well, still the holdouts, maybe like ourselves, where you're like, but I really like phylogenetic approaches. So I wanted a weighted unifrac. Robust Atchison, you know, is not, it's, you know, it's probably better than Bray Curtis but it doesn't take into account, you know, how related the species are to each other. But there is a new package uh, within this R package called Gemelli, which takes into account the phylogeny as well. So now you have, you know, a compositionally aware phylogenetic approach. And we've been just starting it in our lab and results look pretty good. So I think it's, it's looking promising from that, from that angle. Okay, and then I have one extra slide. This is like a completely bonus slide coming back to, sorry, was there any questions about compositionally aware stuff? Good, 
This last slide is about this idea of sometimes it gets brought up and I thought I'd put it here is, hey, can we remember when I talked about relative abundance and their sequencing and that doesn't represent absolute abundance. There have been at least papers describing and talking about different ways to essentially turn our relative abundance into absolute abundance, incorporating the original amount of cells or DNA, depending on what you're talking about, so that we can get back to absolute abundances. And you can imagine different approaches for that. You could literally measure maybe your quantitative PCR for 16S copies. So now we're counting 16S copies and using that as a measure for total abundance. You can imagine taking your raw sample, putting it through flow cytometry, literally counting cells. Could be problematic, of course, depending on the sample type and saying, okay, this sample now has way more cells than this sample. We have a number for that. And we can then essentially multiply that number by our relative abundances to account for absolute abundance. The other approach to this is to try to do a spike in. So you spike in a known quantity of something, and that's our backbone to measure how much of the original sample has changed, essentially. So you have a set known of spike, spike in, either cells or DNA. And you can imagine if this is here, and we have a fraction of absolute cells that changes, then the fraction of spike in tells us how much of the original sample had. So all those approaches essentially allow us to maybe get it at absolute values. There's some biological meaning to that sometimes, right? The classic one, I think, was one of the first papers talking about um, Crohn's disease, where essentially in Crohn's disease, you see shifts obviously in relative abundance, but it doesn't capture what's true is that often they have inflammation. And so you actually have a lot more blood. You actually have a decrease in biomass and absolute abundance techniques capture that information. The other nice thing about it is it gets rid of this whole compositionality approach. So it's like two things that would solve nicely, right? So you get absolute abundance and you don't have to worry about compositional data because now you have in theory sort of counts. It's a little hand wavy there. Yeah. <laughs>